So, goeienavond, al die gaste hierso en ook al ons gaste online, good evening. We are very happy to see such a good turnout in this time of COVID with our masks and all our other protocols in place. And we are very happy that we can stream this live um, to a greater audience outside of Stellenbosch. My name is Vikas van Nikkerk. I'm currently the Dean of Engineering here at Stellenbosch University. And it's my honor to welcome you and to welcome very specific people here who are in attendance. So firstly, I would like, and I always wanted to say this, Madam Registrar, Dr. Runel Retief. <laughs> She's representing the senior management um, of the university today. But we also have the Deputy Vice Chancellor Learning and Teaching, Professor Ra Deresh Ramjugarnav, as well as the Deputy Vice Chancellor Research, Innovation and Postgraduate Studies, Professor Eugene Kluter, online. So thank you very much for attending this online. We also have our Vice Dean Research and Industry Liaison, Professor Pietri Meyer here. Pietri, bye, thank you that you here so is. Um, we have the Chair of the Department of Civil Engineering, Professor Gideon van Seil. We, of course, have our most important guest of honor here and our honorary speaker, Professor Celeste Tullioen, which we will introduce to you now in a little bit more detail. She's also accompanied here with her husband, Dr. Braun Tullioen. Braun, why thank you that you have an on we also um, have Gerard and Anthea Barnardu, the parents of Professor Fulyun, and I believe they are online. So, uh, welcome. Bye, thank you that you by us aangesluit vanavond. Um, we have former colleague Professor Johan Retief online. Johan, bye, welcome. We are in here by us, all is it virtual. And then also we have Mrs. Ermel Dunajski, um, the wife of our former colleague Professor Peter Dunajski. Bye, thank you that you are here with us. Is. And then, ladies and gentlemen, all the other colleagues of civil engineering, the colleagues from faculty, of the Faculty of Engineering, there are friends, collaborators, students, and all the others who are attending online. So thank you very much for making time to be here. You are very, very welcome. And I trust that you will celebrate um, this inaugural lecture with us this afternoon. So it's now my honor and privilege to introduce um, our speaker, Professor Celeste Villeun. She is a professor of structural engineering at Stellenbosch University. She's also a registered professional engineer with a PhD in structural health monitoring. We've been informed that there are certain bridges if you travel around Brackenfeld, that if you go over them, you can do it with a lot of confidence because she was involved in their design and construction. Her research focus is on risk-based decision and structural reliability, and I'm sure she's going to tell us a lot about that this afternoon. She's widely involved in the standardization of structural design and the advancement of pro probabilistic design principles. She serves on numerous um, technical committees, um, both nationally and internationally, where she contributes to national and international standards and codes of structural design. She also regularly presents um, continuing professional development courses to practicing engineers. And then, and this is quite phenomenal, she has been the promoter of two graduated DNGs. So DNGs is a degree that we have at Stellenbosch for very well established um, academics. So she had, she had two of those, and it's a lot of work, Celeste, because normally these old people, they don't know do all the hard work, and <laughs> you have to do a lot of work. So thank you very much for that. 10 PhDs, 10 EMS candidates, and with that, she has authored or co-authored 31 journal articles, 44 peer-reviewed conference papers, and three books. And I think that is for a person um, of her age, and it's, it's a phenomenal record. So um, it's absolutely a privilege to have you here. Then, we are also very happy that in September 2020, she was appointed as the first female vice dean of the Faculty of Engineering, and where she has probably the most responsible job here. So it, it pales in what I have to do. She's responsible for, for teaching and quality assurance. And I promise you, if you haven't been involved with her exam, you can see Professor Basson there is smiling <laughs> behind that mask. If you haven't felt the pressure of, a, of an exa accreditation, then you don't know exactly how you know, what pressure is and how important this job is. So we're very fortunate that she is here. 
Um, Celeste is, as I said already, married to Brahm. They have two children, Joshua and Lisa, and I hope that they are looking at us online. And uh, with that, Celeste, thank you very much for being with us, and thank you very much for sharing some of your work with us this afternoon. The floor is yours. Colleagues, I am told that I am allowed to be maskless in this. <laughs> Uh, in this wonderful occasion, because thank you very much for that beautiful introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, I want to just make a few opening words <clears throat> to the Honorable Vice-Chancellor, uh, Madam Registrar of Stellenbosch University, the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, colleagues and friends, also my Head of Department from Civil Engineering, Thank you very much for being here. It is, it is a great honor for me to be able to give this uh, inaugural lecture. Uh, before I share our research, just also a few words of gratitude. <clears throat> and I, I will read because otherwise I might forget what I may, who I meant to thank, but to God for showering me with many blessings. To my parents and my academic mentors, uh, Professor Johan Retief and Professor Peter Dunajski, the late Professor Peter Dunajski. Uh, you, you aided me in so many ways uh, through your example, your work, also funding, and especially through encouragement. Thank you for that. All my co-workers for the enabling environment that you create by being you, and in particular my colleagues uh, that I've seen here, uh, Professors uh, Roman Lehner and Nico de Koeker, um, who work with me in our research group. It's really an honor and a privilege to work alongside you. Then a very special thank you go to my past and present postgraduate students because it's actually your hard and smart work that des deserves most of the credit here tonight. Then to my husband, Brahm, who is an absolute pillar of support, uh, You are a wonderful person, and I am so thankful to have you in my life. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm really, really thankful for you. Um, and, and then I just want to say that, actually, tonight is not the greatest milestone of this week. <laughs> actually, it is tomorrow, when we are married for 10 years. Thank you so much. And I can clearly not... <laughs> I can clearly not even read emotional words without being emotional. So I am a woman after all. <laughs> then also our kids, Joshua and Lisa, um, you, you are our greatest pride and joy. In spite of all the other things that we might be proud of, uh, I deem you to be the pinnacle of, of my pride and joy. So thank you for being on our lives and sharing it. Then. To my parents and siblings and friends, thank you. Thank you all for attending, and I love you very much. Then finally, to the team of corporate communication and marketing and the registrar's office, everyone who was responsible for organizing this event here tonight, uh, thank you very much for all the hard work that went into it. I appreciate that. Right, then on to technical things. Colleagues, um, my research is... Uh, centered around this topic, risk-based infrastructure design and assessment, and primarily as it relates to standard um, development. Now, I, I will start with a short introduction around our expectations of what we want uh, from our infrastructure in terms of requirements, and then how that finds it, its way into standards uh, that actually dictate how these structures are designed um, on ground level. Then I will speak a little bit uh, around contributions that, that I've made in this field. And I found that when I looked at my body of work that it, it, it came through in these three themes, really. And that's um, load and resistance models that really um, feed into the structural standardization uh, to support that work. Also basic principles, so furthering really risk-based decision principles. And lastly, we also made contributions uh, and um, applications within existing structural, um, in, in, within existing structures um, 
in the existing structure space. And uh, I'm not going to talk about all the different things that we've done, so I thought I would, in each of those themes, just identify a single uh, item and just um, give you a bit of a flavor of the kind of work that, that we are doing. And then I will conclude. So first of all, taking a step back, the value of infrastructure is that uh, the world has lots of infrastructure, um, measuring within trillions of dollars of worth of, of buildings and bridges and, and, and roads, all sorts of civil engineering infrastructures, and we are adding to that every day. Uh, in some countries, some countries are spending up to 10% of their GDP on creating uh, in infrastructure. Um, and of course, the, the amount of infrastructure as it grows, also the maintenance budgets for these infrastructures are also substantial. Then the second thing I want to say is that we typically design these structures for 50 uh, or 100 years design life, but most of the time they get, that gets extended beyond the original design life. Um, and so these structures serve society for typically for a very long time. And then lastly, that um, standardization really underpins the bulk of infrastructure decisions when it comes to both design and maintenance. So the, the exercise of structural standardization, it's, it's an important one, and it can provide uh, value in, in many ways. Now, what, what do we want from our structures? We all use infrastructure every day, and, and we, we have certain expectations of, of that infrastructure, and the expectations are essentially these three things. We want it to be fit for purpose. It must really serve the purpose for which it was designed and built. Then secondly, we don't want to come to work and worry about the roof caving in on our heads, so we really expect the structure to be safe enough, whatever that may mean. I will talk a bit more about that later. And lastly, we do expect also our structures to be cost optimal. And there, I do mean that we want it to be cost optimal over the lifetime of the structure. And we are really balancing construction costs with the risk of failure. Because a failure of a structure has enormous economic consequences in addition to possible loss of life. So we are really balancing these two things in terms of this life cycle cost optimization. And then we do expect that structures meet these expectations in spite of significant uncertainties. And this is a big part of the task of academics and code committee members who need to uh, create the structural um, provisions in standards. Um, so if you look, I can't point there, if you look at this, at this building here, you can see that there are various different loads acting on it. That includes the you know, floor loads inside the building. It includes wind load, snow loads, uh, maybe even thermal expansion uh, and contraction. It includes maybe ground pressures or even possibly seismic effects. And then we have the structure that need to resist all of these loads in combination, of course, and that implies that there are material properties coming into play. Uh, so whether it be masonry or concrete or steel or, or a combination of these, but both the loads and the materials uh, are inherently random. And so when we try to predict both the loads or the materials, we need to deal with that measure of uncertainty there. In addition, of course, to the fact that our prediction models are not perfect. There are simplifications usually, and engineers are very good at making these simplifications, but they are still not perfect, and they introduce model uncertainty into the process. And then also, we are typically extrapolating to very high uh, return periods, because we are looking for a very low probability of failure when we design these structures, and therefore, we take a little bit of data and we extrapolate all the way to a very large return period, and therefore, there's also statistical uncertainty to take into account. And then, of course, because here comes the other things that's quite difficult to quantify, but there's also systemic uncertainty. For example, in the case of structures, maybe climate change might be a good one to mention. 
the fact that the structures that we build today will likely still serve society 200 years from now and then what may the climate look like at that stage and the environmental loads that it need to carry. So <clears throat> if I can move on to slightly more technical then, in, in these standards, we define these expectations that we have as so-called limit states. So we would define serviceability limit states really to capture our expectation that the structure must be fit for purpose. And we would define ultimate limit states to capture our expectation that the structure must be safe enough. And then for each of the limit states, we define likely in the case of serviceability limit states or extreme in the case of ultimate limit states. We define likely or extreme combinations of actions. And then we evaluate the structural capacity, which is indicated here by the distribution R. We evaluate that against the action effect of all those combined actions that's indicated here by, by this graph here, E. And you will see that neither of those two are single values. It's distributions because of all the uncertainties that I have just mentioned before. So engineers are obviously concerned with making sure that the load effect should not exceed the resistance capacity because that would be a failure. And so we aim to achieve low probabilities of failure. We want the chance of the load exceeding the resistance to be quite small. And we cannot target zero because that's, you know, first of all, impossible to practically achieve. But secondly, it would be ridiculously expensive. So what do we target in terms of what is low enough probability of failure? And here I want to refer you to the Bible of principles for reliability of structures. That's the ISO document 2394. And in that document, you will find these two tables that really speak to the reliability levels that we aim to achieve. And the first table captures our expectation that structures must be safe enough. So those values there has been um, derived based on society's willingness to pay for safety, because really we are trading life for life. We trade hours in work for GDP, which we then trade to invest into safety so that we can have higher life expectancy. And so in that, uh, you can find a, a measure for how safe society wants uh, structures to be, what, what's the safety expectation. So safe enough has been derived based on, on those principles and that's captured in the first table. Then the second table contains reliabilities that has been derived based on optimization, literally economic optimization. And needless to say it's tricky when you do economic optimization that you need to put a value to life and, and that also uh, we are helped in that way through this first principle here because that is where society really tells us what is the value of life in that respect. Um, I, I'm deviating. <clears throat> so the second table has been derived based on cost optimization. And so we made, an, not we, uh, Professor Rudovi Rakvic, which, who made this, uh, this derivation, made a number of assumptions uh, that are generally applicable to structures and derived these uh, reliabilities. Now, lucky for us, these reliabilities that are cost optimal are quite often usually higher than the lower limit uh, that relates to our expectation that structures must be safe enough. So what you see on that graph there is you see a decision parameter and that must be a decision parameter that is efficient in terms of increasing safety. And if you increase the decision parameter, you're also increasing the safety of the structure or the level of reliability of the structure. And what happens then is on the lower part of the graph, you can see that the risk to life reduces as you increase that parameter because the probability of failure is getting less. So at some stage then, as the risk to life, as the risk to life reduces, at some stage you cross the so-called society's willingness to pay threshold and that is up to that level that society expects us to invest in safety. After that, we can invest in safety if it is cost optimal. And so the top of the graph shows you how increasing the decision parameter will increase safety cost because obviously making a structure more safe does have a cost. 
but at the same time, it will reduce the probability of failure and therefore it will reduce the expected failure cost. So you get the total costs that's made up of those two components will have an optimum somewhere. And we are lucky that usually this optimal, the cost efficient optimal is usually above, more safe than the level that society expects from structures, from a human uh, life safety perspective. Now, this graph is really just there to visualize risk-based design. So, on the left-hand side, you see a depiction of, of full probabilistic risk-based design, where you can see these graphs here show the uncertainty in the load effect and also the uncertainty in the resistance and um, all the possible combinations where, for example, a high load effect together with a low resistance could be in a failure zone, but usually the bulk of uh, the action and resistance combinations that the structure might see would fall within the safe zone. And of course, the engineer has some measure of um, influence on where this peak sits, right? Because the engineer can design the resistance of the structure in such a way that the peak sits, uh, that a large enough part of this sits in the safe zone in terms of the volume underneath this uh, graph here. And in fact, how safe it needs to be, of course, again, uh, I've said is dictated by this um, reliability-based cost optimization. Now, when we go to standardization, we simplify in a number of ways. So we go to the so-called semi-probabilistic uh, approach, which you see depicted on the top right-hand side. And this uh, reliability-based cost optimization, as I said, has been done in a generic sense for typical structures and is captured in that table so that every engineer does not need to do that from first principles. And then in the semi-probabilistic um, framework, what we do, and by we I mean the academics and code committee members who might be involved in calibrating the standards. We take all the uncertainty, I'm pointing at the screen, <laughs> can you see? <laughs> we take all the uncertainty that sits in this load effect and in the resistance, and also we take the expectation of how safe the structure should be, and we bake all of it into these partial factors. And then the engineer uh, who needs to use the code for design, he or she need to deal only with this very simple inequality. So the engineer needs only to, do, to um, calculate what the load effect will be of the load combinations that is expected on the structure. And then the engineer need to design the structural resistance in such a way that when this resistance is divided by this partial factor that we provide, and that it must be larger than the load effect if it is multiplied by the partial factor that we provide. And therefore, it becomes quite a lot more simple um, and, and we can prevent a human error in the process when all of the basic principles need not be followed for every structure from scratch. Okay, now uh, talking about the three themes uh, in my research, we have done a number of things and I am in each, in the case of each of these themes, I'm going only to talk about the very first thing that is listed uh, in, in each of those themes. So first, <clears throat> in terms of load and resistance models, I will speak now about uh, a great team effort that has been uh, led by this Department of Civil Engineering over the last decade, really, uh, on um, improving the provisions for the ultimate limit state design wind loads for South Africa. So I want to take a moment just to recognize specifically Professor Johan Retief's efforts in this regard. Um, by the time that I joined this university in around 2010, he was already uh, quite active in this field. In fact, he was one of the people who led the revision of the loading standard. Uh, that got published in 2010 at that stage. And as part of that revision process, they didn't at that stage change the wind loading uh, uh, dramatically uh, compared to the previous wind loading, um, but they uh, identified these two very serious um, deficiencies, really, in 
the loading provisions as it were at that stage. And the one is here on the right hand side, you can see that the bottom line depicts the South African wind model, extreme wind model at that stage. Um, it came from the 1989 uh, wind load standard, but um, it was taken into the 2010 wind load uh, model as well. And you can see there that it has a quite a lot less uh, reliability compared to um, counterparts in Europe uh, for similar load situations. And so that was a worry. And the second need that was identified was that the characteristic wind speed map um, that really provides the wind speed from, from which the rest of the provisions derive um, seem to be in need of, of improvement. And so there you see the wind speed map as it looked like at that stage and um, the, the 2010 revision very slightly adapted it uh, and, and I can't talk about that now but it didn't adapt it very much. Uh, and that map was based on only 14 wind stations across South Africa, which is what is depicted there on the left hand uh, map of South Africa, the, the dots on that map, it's the wind stations. So you can see there were very sparse number of wind stations across South Africa that informed that map. Um, and so over the next decade, uh, we, and this was a big team effort, we made a very concerted effort to improve the situation in this regard. So already when I joined the university, uh, Dr. now Dr. Andis Kruger, he was busy doing his PhD on this topic under the supervision of Professor Johan Retief at that stage. And Andris is a scientist at the South African Weather Station. So he had access to data, could extract it and had all the know-how on how to quality control and also identify different climatic mechanisms, etc. everything that is necessary to both extract the data and then um, use it to update the wind map. So Andres Kruger did that uh, as a first stab at improving the wind map and from his work followed the 2018 wind map that is actually currently the wind map that is used in South Africa. Uh, shortly after that, PhD student uh, Jacques Boeta uh, registered with, with me as a supervisor and also Professor Retief was involved. And then we have made a, quite a big effort to address the right-hand side issue, so the problem with the reliability level. And so Jacques has uh, basically derived the partial factor, you know, a whole PhD for one value. And then uh, shortly after, uh, PhD student um, Frederick Bakker joined our team and he added then an additional 11 years of data and did a number of other things which I will speak about shortly to further improve the wind map. So <clears throat> currently what we have in the loading standard uh, for wind loading and that's this uh, 10160 parts one and, two, uh, one and three uh, of 2018 um, is basically this Davenport load chain. And that is typical for many uh, wind standards internationally as well, that the wind is uh, calculated, the design wind for a building is calculated based on the multiplication of these factors here. So it's the partial factor, as I said, you know, this partial factor was derived through the PhD work of, of Jacques Boeta, and uh, yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. Then you also multiply by pressure coefficients, terrain, uh, that, that accounts for terrain, coefficients accounting for terrain, and then here you get the wind pressure from, from this multiplication, which includes, very importantly, the wind speed, the characteristic wind speed, <coughs> depending on where the structure will be built in the country. So that's quite straightforward. You're really just multiplying six or so values with each other, right? So any you know, engineer can easily do that. But of course, each of these components of the wind model um, has you know, all those uncertainties that I spoke about. And that all gets baked, as I said, into this partial factor together with our expectation of the safety level. So that is why it took a whole PhD to derive a single value. 
So here is what Jacques did, and I will not bore you with, with all the details, but essentially you will see that he has considered here on the top right hand side all the components of the wind model. For each of those components he compared uh, to experimental data and to other prediction models to try and quantify both the bias and the uncertainty in these components. And so here you see for terrain roughness influences, uh, pressure coefficients, and then the free field wind. So this, the free field wind here came from the work of uh, Dr. Kruger. And based on all that, through Bayesian updating, he could then derive an updated wind model for South Africa. So you can see the bottom line here is the wind load model from 1989 but the other uh, lines are updated models and essentially we, sh we should target something in this gray zone. So based on that, he then calibrated. Um, and here I only show one of the graphs that were you know, part of the calibration exercise, but it was done for the scope of the code. So it includes all the different load ratios that you may expect. And there's such, such graphs for all the different material types as well and the 1.6 derived from there then. Um, so now I want to talk shortly about the wind map, the, the wind speed map. So you can see how the amount of data has really dramatically increased over um, the last uh, few decades, two or three decades. Um, and really the weather service has made a huge effort thanks to both new technology, but they also installed many additional weather stations countrywide. And you can see how the data has dramatically increased since the, mid, uh, the, the, since the 90s. <clears throat> but because we are extrapolating, as I said so far, into the tail of the distribution, you know, we can only really use stations where we have at least 10 years of data. And even that is already a little bit not too ideal. And so you can see the red there, it's the stations that has uh, 10 years worth of data, each of them. Um, so the middle map that shows the, um, the country, you can see there how the, in the latest effort with PhD student Bucker, that we have identified uh, the climatic mechanisms that we need to, to, to know in order to be sure that we are keeping with independent and identically distributed um, uh, variables when we extrapolate. Uh, but you can also see how the number of stations has really uh, increased and the geographical representation is much better than it used to be. So in summary, the wind map was updated in these sort of three big push, well, two big pushes. I can't even count now. Uh, so starting from what we used to have at the time that Professor Ratif identified the need, it was the wind map of 1989. Um, it, it was then updated in the, that middle picture. You can see from the PhD work of Dr. Kruger. And that middle map includes data up to the year 2007 from 76 stations. And then on the right hand side, this latest effort by Dr. Friedrich Bakker, who just graduated in March this year. He has added another 11 years of data, so now that map considers data up to 2018, which really improves the extrapolation, and uh, it also includes uh, a whole lot more st stations, 135. So Friedrich Bakker also contributed really valuable work, um, not only from the fact that he you know, added the 11 years of data and, and, and did all that work, um, which matched in, in um, procedure uh, much of what Dr. Kruger did. But he also further added through you know, quite smart statistics, uh, very meaningful reductions in the statistical uncertainty of the extrapolation. So he really made a fantastic contribution in that regard. And so, that map uh, that now came out of the PhD of, of Frederick Bakker will, um, it is actually at the moment already under consideration by the load committee uh, for, for that loading code. So he will hopefully soon be the author of the map in the wind load standard. Then in the next theme, 
I want to shortly speak about basically furthering risk-based decision principles, and I want to talk about these target reliabilities. Now, you might recognize these tables. I hope you do. And <laughs> the first table, actually, that made its way into the ISO document there, it, it was, in fact, the result of a collaboration um, with colleagues from ETH Zurich and myself, and we have derived these, principle, these values from uh, the principles of uh, society's willingness to pay. So these values correspond, as I, as I already mentioned, to the lower level of safety that, that we target. Um, and this comes into play more often in existing structures than in new build structures, where it's cheaper to provide safety and therefore cost optimal level usually sits above the acceptable threshold. But for existing structures, we may start to, to, to run into that lower bound. <clears throat> so this, this work was done by basically incorporating in the framework of Rakwich. So I just want to remind you that uh, Professor Rakwich, were, you know, he was the one who, who did the work on cost optimization that is the basis for m most of the target reliabilities in structures today on economic principles. And what we did was that we incorporated the society's willingness to pay principles into that framework uh, and derive these values uh, that then made its way into this ISO, ISO document. <clears throat> And the second thing that came out of this piece of research was that we showed that if you use the value, the society's willingness to pay value, um, it's the amount value uh, per statistical life that the society is willing to invest. If you use this amount as a compensation cost for lost lives when you do this optimization, then automatically the optimal value that you get out will also meet the requirement for safety. And as a second sort of byproduct as well of, of this piece of work, we also, I think, contributed nicely by actually providing quantitative descriptions for uh, these qualitative descriptors in, in the table for economically optimal reliability. So in this table, so this is the table uh, from, from economic optimization, you can find reliabilities as a function of the so-called rel relative cost of safety measures. And you can see here, large, normal, small. And minor, moderate, large. It's quite difficult sometimes to know what, what would constitute minor versus moderate or moderate versus large. And so this is something that also came out of this work that we could uh, provide uh, qu quantitative guidance on that. And here on, on this axis here, you see basically uh, the consequences of failure. So um, minor, moderate, and large. And these dotted lines show basically the relative cost of safety measure. Uh, and, and then these uh, thick lines, A, B, and C, really maps the existing um, categories onto, onto that. So this makes it quite uh, easy to determine then what the optimal level of failure would be. Doesn't sound right, does it? All right, last theme. Uh, we have done a collaboration with the Department of uh, Water and Sanitation um, around their decision criteria for dam rehabilitations. And these uh, decision criteria that they used at, at that stage were basically these six uh, graphs. In each case, <clears throat> on the y-axis, there's the probability of occurrence of a dam failure. And then on the x-axis, in each case, there's a different criteria that relates to consequences of such a failure. So you can see that you know, some of the graphs are, have uh, risk to human life or economic consequences, social consequences, economic, uh, environmental consequences, and so forth. And then the little blocks that you see on those graphs that depicts the dam. There's some uncertainty about what the likelihood of failure is, and there's some uncertainty about what the consequence might be, and that's why it's a block instead of a single point. It gives an indication of how uncertain it is, but the dam is roughly situated there on this, on this uh, uh, likelihood risk uh, profile. And then the dotted line diagonal 
sort of splits this into an uh, acceptable and unacceptable region. You can see that this dam that has been evaluated here is, is on, uh, bordering on unacceptable. Um, and then as part of that evaluation, they are also evaluating the number of, life, of lost lives that's expected in case of a dam failure. And there was a, a quite um, a simple model that were used for that, uh, but um, we compared that to other models worldwide that are based, better based on, on data. And uh, we could propose some very specific improvements to the model that, that was used by the Department of Water Affairs for this, for this purpose. They were also very kind to supply us also with uh, data for 11 dams uh, that were rehabilitated. The, the, these, so these dams followed the whole process of, um, of assessment and Based on those assessments, the Department of Water and Sanitation decided and did rehabilitate these 11 dams. <clears throat> so what we did in this exercise was to really compare those decisions to, to the two criteria that I've spoken about, the safe enough criteria and the economically optimal criteria. And, and this is what we found here. So uh, let me just quickly explain this graph uh, a little bit. So on the bottom here, you find the expected number of fatalities if the dam would fail. And on this edge here, you find the probability of failure. And again, each block is really a dam. And you can see the uncertainty in how many people would die if it fails and the uncertainty in the likelihood of failure from the size of the block. Um, and then for each of these dams here, we have derived for that dam its society's willingness to pay threshold. So it is dam specific. It depends on how efficient the safety measures would be. And so these lines here depict essentially the safety, the, the society's willingness to pay threshold for a specific dam. And only the one dam, Wenzel Dam, uh, really needed to be rehabilitated based on the safety requirement. It's the only dam that sits above its society's willingness to pay threshold in terms of risk. And five of the dams, those are the ones highlighted in green, they, were, they should have been rehabilitated based on economic principles. So the economic benefit of that rehabilitation is uh, it, it makes the decision a worthy one. But the other six dams, Maybe there were other re requirements that, that, led to, or that should have led to their uh, rehabilitation, like environmental or societal things that are not accounted for properly. But the two big considerations usually is financial and life loss. So this gives an indication that there may be room for, for sharpening the pencil and refining the decision criteria. And in the context of the fact that there's a very large number of dams on the priority list of the Department of Water Affairs. It may be worthwhile uh, to, to continue this, this work um, in order to refine those decisions. So, in conclusion, thank you for listening. I can hear myself talking very fast. <laughs> <clears throat> in broad, we contributed to the load and resistance models for structural design, and we also contributed through uh, an exercise of assessing reliabilities and calibrating design provisions, not only for wind loads, also for a number of other um, models and, and codes. Secondly, we advanced in various ways the risk basis of design in standardization. And thirdly, we... Um, did useful applications uh, in terms of decisions for existing structures. Uh, and we also actually have a Sunroll project coming up soon, hopefully. <laughs> it's been delayed slightly, but yeah, we have a Sunroll project that would also um, be looking at existing bridges and provisions for those. Then I'm also happy to say that our research impact is enhanced by our other activities, um, meaningfully enhanced, and that is through our participation in various national and international standardization efforts. And I really also want to um, 
acknowledge colleagues within the Joint Committee for Structural Safety, which, is, um, which, uh, which are really meaningfully driving forward pre-normative work in, in this space. And then nationally mostly, we also present uh, quite often continuous professional development events to local industry in order to disseminate all these um, improvements and, and principles. Then I really do believe that the PhD students that, and po other postgraduate students that get delivered out of uh, the group are a very valuable asset to South Africa in the broad. And then lastly, but very importantly, we do have meaningful international collaborations uh, going on um, with, various, uh, with various collaborators, both in Europe and in Australia. Um, and also not as active, but we also have contacts in, in America and Canada. Lastly, looking into the future, I do foresee that we will see an increased focus on sustainability um, and, and there also the extension of the useful life of existing structures will become more and more important, especially because just the bulk of existing structures are also growing daily. So on, on both counts, I expect that we will see an increase in focus on existing structures as well. And then there's already uh, movement in terms of the provisions for climate change. We'd need to really find a, a foothold in standardized procedures as well. And in this, all of this, using advanced methods uh, and data would be valuable. So lastly, once again, I want to acknowledge just the fact that this is really a team effort, and I want to acknowledge the real valuable contributions of others, um, you know, both in what I've presented here today and also in the accompanying review paper. I, I am a common denominator in all of those things, but really for most of the items, there would be someone else that can claim the greater, uh, the greater credit, uh, be it a postgraduate student or a collaborator or a colleague. So I really want to thank everyone for that. And also in all of this, I was facilitated by my mentors and friends and family with their support. So thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it. I have to say, um, when I contemplated what we might be hearing this evening, I thought about, yes, infrastructure and concrete problems. And then I read a quote that you will find in uh, Professor Fulhun's inaugural lecture publication, which goes as follows. Structural engineering is the art of modeling materials we do not wholly understand into shapes we cannot precisely analyze to withstand forces we cannot properly assess in such a way that the public at large has no reason to suspect the extent of our ignorance. And I'm sure all of you will be uh, familiar with this quote. I found it quite surprising not being from the engineering discipline myself. Um, and then we've heard Professor Fulhun um, starting off with her lecture speaking about uncertainties. And uncertainties are the very last notion, the notion of uncertainty that I would associate with engineering. And she spoke about inherent randomness, uh, prediction model uncertainty, lack of data, systemic uncertainty, and that of course made me think of the two years of the COVID pandemic and the kinds of decision making that we had to undertake during this time. And it, it, it dawned on me how valuable this work is and how, um, how valuable it is if you can find um, highly intelligent, clever engineers that can help us um, to, find, to find an optimal solution for many of these uncertainties that we have to deal with. So the value of risk-based decision-making, infrastructure design and assessment are not lost even on me, but definitely not on us. So, um, Professor Fulhun's research on structural reliability and risk-based decision-making clearly speaks of academic excellence, but as Professor Fulhun illustrated, also of impact, which is of utmost importance um, for the academic endeavor and also for this institution, and the dissemination of her work through teaching, as she alluded to, um, and also through professional um, 
uh, development, con continuing professional development courses to industry and the community engagement through the participation in technical committees. So she really ticks all the boxes of the three pillars of the academic endeavor. And then I would not be true to myself if I didn't mention how awesome it is to have a professor in engineering who's a woman. And I did some Googling, as one does, and I saw that only one, one of five engineers in South Africa are women, and um, globally, 12% of engineers, of civil engineers, are women. So this is really such an achievement also for the faculty, and I want to congratulate the faculty. I know that the faculty has gone uh, to great lengths to recruit girls from, at school, from school level. Uh, to embark on undergrad engineering um, um, studies. And we read in the most recent research the value of role models for those girls coming in. So celebrating your professoriate is not a celebration only of your own achievements, but it's really also a celebration of having role models that when these youngsters come into the system, they have something to aspire for and they know that it is possible. So thank you so much and congratulations once again. And apparently we have to do a fist bump, a COVID friendly fist bump. So congratulations. So uh, Celeste did not do this all alone and uh, thanking some people um, just uh, shows that. Uh, already you have uh, acknowledged uh, the mentors, the colleagues, and family, uh, but I will just officially do that. But, you know, to make it not too harsh, I'll start with you, to thank you. Um, Celeste, you know, within a decade, Celeste has made a career change. She made a change in her study field, um, and she did succession planning. You know, and now she's dean. So within a decade, she did all of that. That's actually a pretty short time. But uh, that really has had impact, and you've alluded to the impact on our industry in various ways, but also in our program, in our department, and some of the evidence is around here that you know, being a deterministic person myself, uh, despite all the encouragement, you know, we now recruit academics that think probabilistically wise and you know it's not a separate program but it is installed in, in all our academics and in various ways in geotechnical engineering in uh, structural engineering in construction management so it really your work has had, had impact and it continues family um, Bram uh, Joshua and Lisa you know uh, not to be dramatic about it but I think you demonstrate that you know, we can benefit from the diversity of this person without the societal fabric being torn apart <laughs> and the family life being broken down. So thank you for that. Um, I also think that uh, Celeste, in my mind, knowing her for more than a decade, comes very close to depicting our values. And I think we, we can thank your parents. Uh, they probably had a little share in that. Um, the dignitaries being here, all the attendees, but all the dignitaries online and in and, and person, our DVCs, our registrar, our dean, vice deans, chairs. I know you are very busy people. Thank you very much. She, uh, she mentioned the students. Um, there are students here. This is what uh, we lean on and, and uh, also when we lose our faculties. So um, thank you for yourself, uh, for, for your presence and support. Uh, the mentors, um, was it in 2009 that Peter Dunajski and I bumped into you in the passage after a faculty board meeting and he convinced you for the career change? Uh, I've, I'd like to thank Peter uh, and, and also uh, Mrs. Uh, Dunajski listening in. We owe you a debt of gratitude for that. Johan Ratif, you mentioned. Um, all the practical arrangements, I understand you were a bit of a guinea pig for a first. Uh, it seemed to go well, so thank you very much to, to um, you know, everybody that arranged the, the whole communication, the recording and uh, broadcasting, the publication, and then the refreshments as well. So I'm told to invite you to now go and enjoy them, 
And if you need to sit down, even after the long sit, there are chairs in chalkboard that you can use to sit down. Enjoy the evening with us. Thank you.